Santa Barbara Community Church, welcome to worship. I know we are meeting all over town right now, and uh, I think that's a good thing because the Lord promised that he would be with us in our midst when we're gathered in his name. Uh, so wherever you are, I want to take just a moment and quiet our hearts together as we come to worship. Um, so would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are worth all of our prayers. You are worthy, you are good, and we come to you because we know we need you. So would you be pleased by our singing, pleased by the way we listen, and Lord, I pray that you'd fill us up so that we can be your disciples and your servants in this world. In and through Jesus we pray.
Greetings, everyone. I know this is a pretty different format than usual, and I never thought I would come to this, but these are interesting times we're living in. As you know, uh, generally I would describe us as a low-tech, high-touch church, but here we are. I think it's a little bit odd to do this video format, but these are the days we're living in. And while different, I hope you'll enjoy worshiping together in a little different format for the next couple weeks until we can resume our normal, regular patterns of meeting together. As you know, we've been in the opening chapters of Genesis for a few months now, and today we come to perhaps one of the most famous stories in the whole Bible, that is Noah and his ark. Uh, some people think of this story as just a cute Sunday school story for kids. So when Lair and I were expecting our first son, Josh, I remember uh, decorating his nursery with, with Noah's Ark kind of themes. And so his crib sheets had animals and rainbows and boats and that sort of thing. And for a lot of people, that's what the story of Noah's Ark is. It's just a cute story for children. On the other hand, some would see this story as uh, a horrific tale about a genocidal god who goes apocalyptic and destroying uh, the earth. And it's anything but cute. But my hope today is that we, as we look at this story again with fresh eyes, uh, we'll see it as neither cute nor horrific, but rather a story that sheds light on what it looks like to live a life of faith in a holy and gracious God. So we're going to read Genesis 6 in just a moment. But first, let me just remind you of, of where we've been. Uh, the first few weeks, we looked at the fact that God created a beautiful world that he loved, that was full of delight and pleasure and meaningful work and intimate relationships. But things went downhill pretty quick, didn't they? We saw that uh, the first couple turned their backs on God and his benevolent authority in their lives. And we saw the catastrophic consequences that that brought. 
last week, uh, Sandy Richter did a terrific job teaching us through the story of Cain and Abel, and she kept using the phrase that the, the poison had spread. The poison had spread uh, from one generation to the next. And if we had kept reading in, in chapter 4, we would see uh, one of Cain's descendants, a man named Lamech, um, evil went beyond him in violence and aggression, and he, he bragged about uh, how he had killed a man and uh, so forth. We might say that the poison had spread even further. The darkness is getting deeper. Chapter 5 of Genesis uh, is, a, is a genealogy that fast forwards us in the story clear to the time of Noah. And when we get to the chapter 6, the first four verses are this really obscure story that I don't know, maybe Benji understands. You can ask him later. I don't continue, uh, totally understand what it's about. But it says the sons of God uh, saw the daughters of man. They saw that they were good and attractive, and they took them as their wives. Now, again, I don't know who the Nephilim are or who, who exactly are the, the primary players. But when we hear those words, saw and good and took, this should bring back echoes from the garden to us of when Eve uh, saw the fruit, that it was attractive, it was good, and she took it. And so when we reach chapter 6, these opening verses, uh, the main point that we should see is that the boundaries continue to be transgressed and the poison keeps spreading. The darkness is getting darker still. And so that brings us to the point where we're going to look at today. Um, I'd like you to pause the video for just a moment and have somebody in your group read Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 22. So we'll pause for a moment and I'll be right back with you. All right, welcome back. So the first thing I want you to notice is just this picture this gives us of, of depravity, how dark uh, the darkness is here. And verse 5 begins by telling us that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. That is a grim picture indeed. One commentator notes that it tells us about the extensiveness of sin as well as the intensiveness of sin. That is, it's extended beyond one family or region uh, to the ends of the earth. It's gone global. Not only that, but this, the intensiveness of sin is pictured here as, as this depravity controls not only people's behavior, but also their thoughts as well. This is not a periodic lapse of judgment every once in a while. This is a picture of a chronic condition of all mankind. So in verse 11, if you skip down to 11 to 13, the word corrupt keeps coming up again and again along with violence. So verse 11, the earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth and behold, it was corrupt and all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. And then down at the end of verse 13, God says, behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now, one thing that you might not get here is there's a word play going on in the Hebrew. Uh, the word for corrupt and destroy come from the same uh, form, same forms of uh, a verb that could be translated ruined. So as one translator puts it, the earth was filled with violence and had gone to ruin. God had saw that the earth was ruined. They had ruined their way. And so God says, I will ruin them. Uh, again, God's decision to destroy here is based on what is virtually self-destroyed or self-destroying already. This violence that had characterized Cain and Lamech and chapter 4 is now characteristic of all humanity. And so this picture and the story here is, is the effects of sin, the rebellion against God is, well, it's like a terrible virus that's infected the whole earth and is destroying everything. And it's within this context that we meet Noah. Look at verse 8. We see here, uh, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Now, some of you know, I've said before, at some point I'd like to do a sermon series on the big butts of the Bible. And we might study passages like Ephesians chapter 2, which tells us that we were dead in our transgressions and sins in which we used to live. We were objects of wrath. But then it says, but God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It's 
by grace you have been saved. That's a big but. Uh, Another one, we might look at Romans chapter 3. After three chapters, uh, beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans, just pointing out how deep and grave our situation is in sin. Uh, In in Romans 3.20, it says, By works of the law, no one will be justified. In other words, there's no way we can work or dig ourselves out of this hole. But then in, in verse 21, it says, But now... But now the righteousness of God has been revealed apart from the law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And so here we see, but Noah. Noah stands in contrast uh, to the tidal wave of wickedness that has swept over and flooded the earth. And verse 9 tells us that Noah was, was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Now, to me, that that sounds like he was a perfect dude, but we shouldn't think of this as perfection here. Rather, verse 8 reminds us again that he found favor in the eyes of God. Now, another word for favor, we could translate that as grace. Noah found grace. Uh, He's a recipient of God's grace. And as we know, grace is never won or earned. It's always received or found. Tremper Longman, who was part of our church for uh, some time and and is an Old Testament scholar, writes, Noah survived the flood not because he deserved it, but because of the unmerited favor of God. God's choice of Noah was an act of grace, but Noah responded in obedience and thus becomes for us a model of faithful response to God. So this life of faith and obedience is summed up in a beautiful phrase at the end of verse 9. Do you see it? Noah walked with God. Love that. Noah walked with God. Uh, The men's ministry right now is reading this this book by John Mark Comer called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. It's a great book, and in in it he, he writes this. There's a reason people talk about walking with God rather than uh, running with God. That's because God is love, and love has its own pace. So he quotes in the book a guy named Walter Adams, who was the spiritual director for C.S. Lewis, and Adams said this. He says, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer and only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. I don't know about you, but when I think about this unhurried pace that it means to walk with God, I can't help but think about pictures in the news, and maybe you've even been personally down to Costco where people are in this frenzied fight over massive bags of toilet paper and the last container of wipes or hand sanitizer. It just stands in stark contrast to what it means to walk at a slow pace with God. Uh, This frenzied activity doesn't help us Uh, develop an attitude of love or service, does it? So Noah walked with God, and this led him to live very differently from those around him. Uh, His faith in God was demonstrated by his obedience, of course, in building this ridiculously huge, massive boat. This this ark was a football field and a half long, uh, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall, three decks, just an incredible thing. And we can just imagine what people around him thought of what he was building. Yeah, he lived differently and and we're called to do the same. These are extraordinary days we're living in, aren't they? And in light of the fear and uncertainty in our world, I wanna ask, what do you think it looks like to live as people who walk with God, who live Uh, not in fear, but in faith. Well, as helpful as it is to uh, learn from Noah and his unwillingness to conform to the world around him, uh, the story is not really about Noah at all, is it? It's about God. Uh, One commentator named John Walton uh, helpfully points out that Noah is silent throughout this entire story. He he writes, he has no response to God's announcement, no questions about the ark or the animals, no plea on behalf of anyone else, no cries for mercy, no bursts of joyful gratitude at the prospect of being saved, no grief for a world, world destroyed. Noah is like a bit player, and 
the star of the account is God himself. Uh, the story is not about Noah or the ark or the animals. It's about God. And so I just want to spend our last couple minutes saying, what, what do we see about the person of God in this account? Well, the first thing that we see is simply that God is a holy God. Uh, because he is holy, he can't stand to look on idly as this disease of sin spreads and wreaks havoc on the creation that he loves so much. He sees the evil and the violence and that come from human sin, and it grieves his heart, the scriptures tell us. You know, there's a lot of politicians, rightly or wrongly, taking a lot of heat today for not responding wisely or quickly enough to this pandemic that we're in the midst of. But what we see here is that God understands what's at stake, and he is willing to take drastic measures. Because God is holy, and he's grieved by this corruption and exploitation in the world, he does something about it. And I want to say this is not, he's not just grieved by, by the big kinds of corruption and violence, by the school shootings, uh, by the drug cartels and the sex trafficking and the child pornography and the wars in Syria. But God is grieved because he's holy by the thousands of other manifestations of sin as it works its way out in our community and our lives, ways that degrade our humanity and that of those around us and exploitation of the earth. This grieves the heart of God. In verse 7, it says that this holy God sees the corruption and the violence in the world and he intends and determines to blot it out, blot out this evil. But I want you to see how this is not just a manifestation of God's holiness, but we also see in the story that God is a God of grace. He's a gracious God. This word to blot out is the same one used in, in Psalm 51, where David cries out, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to the, your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. You see, ultimately, it's, it's this story of Noah is not able to put an end to the problem of corruption and violence in the world. But it points us forward to the one who does, to the truly righteous and blameless one, the one who walked perfectly with God throughout the years of his life, the one who walked consistently at the pace of love and by whose obedience of faith our sins have been blotted out. See, Jesus of Nazareth took the fall he was treated like the virus that needed to be eradicated so that we could be cleaned and healed from our sin. This is the love and grace of God that we're meant to see a foreshadowing of here. That God was not willing to give up on humanity, but was intent on, on saving us uh, so that we could walk with God without fear all the days of our life. Now, Benji's going to join me here and and give uh, just speak for a few minutes to, about these unusual times that we live in and give a few reflections on what it means to walk with God and live as people of faith and love in this historical moment. All right, here we are with Benji. You feeling okay? You look a little <laughs> peaked. I feel fine. Okay, Thank good. You. So we're appropriate social distance here. Mm -hmm. Fill us in. What are, you, what are you thinking about these days, about what it looks like to walk with God like Noah did as people of faith and yeah. not fear? Yeah, it's been pretty remarkable the last couple of days to watch how rapidly things have changed. We've gone from hearing about this virus in other parts of the country, maybe even in other parts of the state, to seeing things getting canceled and shut down all around us. And um, the opportunity to lose track of who we are and who we belong to seems really pronounced. And yet, I think in the midst of this, it's really important to remember that we have an opportunity, like Noah, to walk faithfully with God in the midst of uncertain times. And I want to give us just some thoughts on how we can do that really well in the days ahead. And the first is I would encourage us to continue to be a people marked by confidence. We serve a God who is not caught by surprise by this turn of events. He is well aware of what is happening on his earth and to his people. We should not let this 
unsettle us unduly. And I would also say that we need to remember that God has promised to walk really closely with his people through seasons of triumph as well as seasons of challenge. And so in Isaiah 41, we hear these really encouraging words from God himself, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God, I will strengthen you. And then it goes on to say, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. And I think we need to be mindful in these days about who we belong to. We also need to be mindful about what we're taking in. I think for some of us, the social distancing or the quarantines may increase our opportunity to be taking in sources of information or news that honestly just aren't good for us. So whether that is increased attention to social media feeds or whether that is more time spent looking at cable news or obsessively checking in on the stock market, there's a lot of opportunity to increase our anxiety and our fear. And yet when we pay too close attention to those things, we have the potential to forget that we belong to a God who has told us not to fear. And so I would encourage us, church, in the days ahead, let's be people who are turning to the source of truth, spending more time on our scriptures than on our social media feeds, reminding ourselves who we are and who we belong to. And ultimately, Jesus' words in Matthew 6 ought to encourage us forward. He said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I think that's really relevant in these days. And another thing I would encourage us towards is to be people of really wise courage. Jesus said to his disciples as they were headed out into a context of uncertainty, he said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. But then he said, therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. We have the same opportunity to be people who are both wise and courageous, to be both shrewd and innocent. And these days, I think, call for wisdom as we respond to the insights and recommendations of both our medical professional communities, our local and regional governors. And I think we have an opportunity to live out really wise lives. We aren't going to make any gains for the kingdom by being fools in the days ahead. And yet, this unprecedented season, I would say, also offers us an opportunity to be really courageous and to heed Jesus' call to love our neighbors as ourselves in maybe some new ways that we hadn't considered before. And so as terms like social distancing um, are on the rise and we have an opportunity, I think with wisdom and discretion, we should show up in surprising ways. Maybe places that other people have vacated. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. Mike, that in the early church, part of what validated their faith in times of crisis was their willingness to show up in places that other people were unwilling to do so because of their confidence in who Christ Mm -hmm. is and what he's called them to do. And so let's be courageous and even creative about what it looks like to love our neighbors really well Mm -hmm. in the midst of this this day and these weeks that are really marked by a lot of anxiety. And then the final thing I would say is we our call is still to be faithful, to move forward that The task of making disciples is unchanged, even in a coronavirus world. And so I want us to remain faithful in that pursuit of making disciples. If you are a parent of young kids who are now going to be spending more time at home than you originally thought, think of that as a discipleship opportunity. If you're a parent like you are of teenagers who are seeing all sorts of opportunities canceled, in the midst of that disappointment, speak to them about who Christ is and how he enters into even our seasons of difficulty and disappointment. If you are part of the older population in our church and feeling like this might be an isolating event for you, be courageous to reach out. And if you have older friends in your life, be the first to reach out to them. And let's continue to push one another to be more like Christ, to become more like Christ, and to be disciples in the days ahead. I would also encourage each of us to be on the lookout for new conversations. People seem especially open to conversations, whether that is the half an hour line you're waiting in at Trader Joe's (laughs) or wherever you might find yourself in the days ahead. People seem in these days of quarantine and isolation to be looking for connection. Let's be ready to give that and let's be ready to ask and be ready to speak of Jesus as the one who gives us that. And so, church, I just want to encourage us in the days ahead. Let's press forward as people who belong to a sovereign and good God. Let's remember that by being people of confidence and wise courage, people of faithfulness. And let's do this for the glory of God and for the sake of the world that he loves. That's really good. Yeah. That's great. Well, we've got a couple more songs here that you can worship to as well, but we love you guys. We're praying for you all. 
and the Lord bless you.
And God, you are our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. We put our trust in you afresh today, Lord.
and ask that you would guide our steps. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray together. Amen. Clap, clap. Give God the glory, glory, rise and shine and mm. you good? That'll be in the outtakes for sure. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you only do one take? You ready? Just kidding. <clears throat> How rapidly things have changed. We've gone from thinking that... Sorry, um, can you put your foot down? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just not a very flattering <laughs> <level>. <laughs>